My name is Patricia Coyle. I'm professor and interim chair and director of the MS Comprehensive Care Center in the Department of Neurology at Stony Brook University in Stony Brook, New York. I'm delighted to be giving this lecture for the CMSC 2020 virtual annual meeting on progressive MS diagnosis, clinical course, and long-term management. In support of improving patient care, CMSC is jointly accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, and the American Nurses Credentialing Center to provide continuing education for the healthcare team. This presentation offers one hour contact for uh, continuing education for physicians and nurses, for pharmacists and physician assistants, and for psychologists and social workers. And these are my personal financial disclosures. Our learning objectives. We're gonna be talking about the damage mechanisms implicated in progressive MS. We're gonna review diagnostic criteria for primary progressive PPMS and secondary progressive SPMS, and we'll outline current best therapeutic approaches to progressive MS. We have four parts. I'll begin with definition etiology, then go on to diagnosis, clinical course, and long-term management. I do have a lot of slides that's for you to go over later. I will be touching on what I think are the important points. So let's start with the definitions and etiology. Progressive MS is gradual worsening that must be objectively documented. The neurological exam should be abnormal. And that um, abnormalities has to be independent of an acute attack or relapse of MS. There can be fluctuations, even a little bit of improvement. There can be periods of clinical stability because the deterioration may be so low grade that it's hard to really appreciate as we'll see. There may be superimposed relapses, the focal inflammatory phase. It's not a black or white, all or none phenomenon. Progressive MS gradual worsening is believed to represent the clinical expression of neurodegeneration in MS and peculiarly it's age locked to midlife. Now we have two progressive phenotypes. Primary progressive is the unusual progression from onset, not signaled by a relapse. Secondary progressive MS is a relapsing patient, perhaps for many years, who at midlife typically transitions to gradual worsening independent of relapses. That person has already been diagnosed in the vast majority with relapsing MS. It's not uh, one day you're relapsing, the next day you're progressive. There's about a five year transition period where that individual is at continuing risk for having relapses. And we don't have clear cut diagnostic criteria for SPMS. Um, the global MS-based registry looked at dozens of different definitions for SPMS. They came up with the best one for them that was dependent on worsening on the EDSS said you couldn't be SPMS unless the EDSS was at least four, your cortical spinal functional system had to be at least two. That doesn't work. That's not practical and it's not correct. So they artificially created a definition and it was the best for them, but it wasn't a very good definition. And it's interesting, SPMS typically as a group has the highest macroscopic lesion burden and the longest disease duration. So progressive MS is age dependent. That's peculiar, why is that? We do not know. But if you think about the aging central nervous system, it must be that you pass a critical a level of injury to the CNS of neurodegenerative injury with aging, where you begin to see the clinical expression of the neurodegenerative changes in MS. And 99% of people will develop progression before the age of 75 typically around age 45, you don't see it occurring in the true elderly. And there are multiple special pathogenetic mechanisms for this neurodegeneration. That's important to appreciate because that's our roadmap for developing better effective treatments for neurodegeneration. So first of all, there's diffuse injury to synapses in particular, axons and neurons. There's compartmentalized inflammation. Progressive MS has marked microglia activation. This is part of the innate immune system behind a relatively functioning blood-brain barrier. There's extensive cortical demyelinization with neuron loss. There's evidence of mitochondrial damage, oxidative injury, 
disrupted axonal transport. The brain is remyelinating up to the early 30s and then it stops and then you begin to have loss of myelin and white matter tracts. So this age-related loss of a trophic support of myelin. You see increased iron deposition, which is driving, amplifying oxidative damage evidence for glutamate excitotoxicity and astrocyte activation. Now there's a very interesting chronic active lesion slowly expanding or chronic active lesion with RIM. This used to be an autopsy diagnosis, but it was realized using susceptibility weighted imaging that you could see it first on a 7T and now even on a 3T using uh, T2 star. These are chronic smoldering lesions that are increasing in size with no gadolinium enhancement, no focal breach of the blood-brain barrier. Their center is relatively inactive. Their edge has the macrophages and the microglia. You may actually see a phase rim where they have iron that's being gobbled up and um, myelin uh, components, and they show significant T1 hypointensity as well. This is most commonly seen in progressive MS, typically years of disease and older age, but the newer techniques are identifying this lesion in at least 56% of MS, and they've even been described in radiologically isolated syndrome, RAS. So they are not unique to secondary progressive or primary progressive MS. They seem to be associated with more aggressive disease, and they seem to be a window into the neurodegenerative intra-CNS compartmentalized chronic inflammatory state. So this is something to be looking for. Now there's debate, is primary progressive and secondary progressive the same thing? And the consensus currently is that it is. It's a shared neurodegeneration. And that's why you'll see a number of progressive trials where they combine primary progressive MS and secondary progressive MS. This was just one interesting study that looked at a molecular analysis of the uh, CSF proteins over 1100. And they looked at a, a series of MS individuals, spinal fluid from healthy controls, spinal fluid from other neurologic disease controls, both inflammatory and non-inflammatory. While well, using this DNA aptamer CSF protein analysis technique, they could distinguish MS spinal fluid from healthy controls and other neurologic diseases. They could distinguish a progressive MS spinal fluid from relapsing MS. They could not distinguish primary progressive spinal fluid from secondary progressive spinal fluid. It was identical. And they interpret this as a sign that progression is an identical process despite the clinical phenotype. Now let's turn to diagnosis. I think everybody should be using to make a diagnosis in the unusual primary progressive patient the 2017 revised McDonald criteria. They're very straightforward. Everybody needs to be familiar with this. Everybody needs to be able to answer whether their newly diagnosed primary progressive patient meets these criteria. There has to be worsening progression over a year, at least a year, can be any combination of retrospective and prospective, and you need two of three other criteria. At least one lesion in the brain in a characteristic area, periventricular, cortical, juxtacortical, or infratentorial, at least two spinal cord lesions on MRI scan, or CSF-specific oligoclonal bands. Now, the criteria indicate the MRI lesions have to be at least three millimeters. If you're calling them periventricular, they have to touch the ventricles. Juxtacortical has to touch the cortex, and we can count symptomatic and asymptomatic lesions. It's known that it's difficult to make a diagnosis of primary progressive MS. It's an unusual form of MS. There's typically a delay in diagnosis. That's why it's so important to utilize these specific criteria. Well, what about SPMS? We have no recognized formal diagnostic criteria for SPMS. That MS-based uh, diagnosis has not been universally accepted. But we're not typically making a diagnosis of MS in this individual. They've probably had a longstanding diagnosis of relapsing MS. You would like to see sustained worsening, not getting better. Uh, this too is a delayed diagnosis. On average, takes about three years. Often an astute patient will realize their secondary progressive before the physician does. 
and this is just a sign of that. This is quite interesting. It's from UC San Francisco. They have very good MS neurologists there. It's their EPIC MS database. What they described were relapsing patients followed over years were decompensating, getting worse, independent of relapses, and the doctors didn't recognize it, and not even the patients recognized it. It seemed to relate with increasing brain volume loss, atrophy, increasing T1 black holes. Really, relapsing patients under their eyes were transitioning to progressive disease, and it took a long time to realize that. So this is a very, very important uh, point that we really need in relapsing patients in midlife to be on the lookout for transition to progressive disease. Now, the, the McDonald diagnostic criteria recommend we give a provisional disease course and classify the phenotype. Every patient with progressive MS should know that that's what you think they have. Remember, our disease activities are active versus not active and progressing versus non-progressing. Active means over a defined time frame, like the past year, you've had a clinical attack or a new or enlarging T2 lesion or a new contrast lesion, then you're active. If you haven't, you're not active. And this would apply to progressive phenotypes. Progressing versus not progressing, again, with a defined time frame like the last year, is strictly a clinical um, evaluation. Has the neurological exam deteriorated? Then they're progressing. If it's been stable, then they're not progressing. And this refers only to the two progressive phenotypes, PPMS and SPMS. So we should be able to classify that. The diagnostic criteria also mention this interesting progressive solitary sclerosis. This may be a form foost of primary progressive MS. It was first described 30 years ago. There's a single lesion on MRI scan and a course that seems like primary progressive MS. In, a, in the largest um, group uh, written about to date from Mayo Clinic, they gathered 30 such patients, predominantly had a cervical cord lesion or cervical medullary, predominantly were, present, were presenting with slowly worsening monoparesis, hemiparesis, or quadriparesis. Very rarely did they have an acute subacute presentation, and their flavor was that a high proportion likely had a demyelinating MS type of picture. So they didn't recognize it, but they said maybe this is a form foost of primary progressive MS. And just be aware that this is a very interesting entity, progressive solitary sclerosis with typically just one lesion and a slowly worsening course. Now, primary progressive MS has its own differential. You need to rule out a structural spinal cord lesion. There are certain interesting genetic things like the variety of hereditary spastic paraparesis, adrenal myeloneuropathy in midlife, particularly in a woman. You don't want to miss a metabolic cause of gradual worsening, vitamin B12 deficiency, vitamin E deficiency, copper deficiency, and then certain inflammatory, infectious, and other conditions may present with gradual worsening suggestive of primary progressive MS. I think this is an unusual form of MS that warrants a really thorough diagnostic workup. You should do selected blood work. In particular, you want to document the B12 level, maybe HTLV1 antibodies for TSP ham. You probably want to look at copper, zinc, vitamin E uh, levels, maybe very long chain fatty acids or more specific gene testing. I would do CSF in everybody, in everybody. There's a high yield, 80% plus, are going to be CSF oligoclonal band positive, highly helpful for the diagnosis of primary progressive MS. And I would really, you have to do imaging of the entire central nervous system, not just brain, but spinal cord down to the conus, including the conus. A thorough workup really makes you most confident that you're accurately diagnosing this unusual form of MS. Classical PPMS will have the lowest macroscopic lesion load in the brain. The brain actually may look quite good. They have a lot of microscopic damage, how, um, however, but they may have quite significant spinal cord disease and often prominent atrophy. And they have a lot of microscopic damage. If you use mag transfer imaging, diffusion tensor, functional MR, MR spectroscopy, your classic PPMS patients will have way more of this microscopic damage in brain than let's say relapsing MS. This is just a table that looks at relapsing SPMS, PPMS, 
your contrast enhancement is most marked in relapsing MS, whereas T1 black holes, atrophy, gray matter, microscopic changes more marked in progressive MS and also hitting the spinal cord where you actually have a greater T2 lesion load in the spinal cord typically in progressive than relapsing MS. Now let's turn to the clinical course. The classic presentation for primary progressive MS is a progressive myelopathy, progressive gait difficulties, and leg weakness difficulties. That's how 83% of MS patients present typically in midlife. However, unusually, PPMS may present with a progressive cerebellar syndrome, about 8%, a progressive hemiplegia, about 6%, and then rarely a progressive brainstem syndrome, progressive cognitive loss. I've made that diagnosis in several individuals or even progressive vision loss. PPMS shows about a decade later typical age of onset than CIS relapsing MS and an equal sex ratio. Men and women are equally affected for PPMS. Therefore, theoretically, men are preferentially vulnerable to PPMS. It only makes up about 10% to 15% of MS very unusual in the pediatric age group to see PPMS, much, much lower numbers. This is an age-related phenomenon. So you need to be very cautious about making a diagnosis of PPMS in a pediatric MS individual. Even though they are lacking the major focal inflammatory phase that really characterizes relapsing MS, you can still see relapses in about 1.5% of primary progressive MS patients on an annual basis. And of course, we say the progressive phenotypes, that conveys a worse prognosis than relapsing phenotypes. Uh, the death rate. This is from a Norwegian study where the median life expectancy was shortened by about seven years in MS compared to controls. It was uh, uh, earlier, uh, a, a, a earlier death in men than in women. Uh, and more so in primary progressive MS individuals than relapsing MS. And the standardized mortality ratio was actually significantly higher for PPMS than for relapsing MS. Not surprising really if you have a uh, phenotype where you're gonna have more disability. Now this is from the MS-based global registry. It's looking at 853 primary progressive MS individuals, and it was tracking their rate of worsening of progression. And what they found were there were three patterns, three patterns. About 17% of their PPMS patients showed very mild progression. It took them over 20 years to reach an EDSS of six, meaning you need a unilateral assistive device, a cane to walk 100 meters. 44% had moderate progression. They reached EDSS six by 10 and a half years and 38% showed very marked progression. They reached EDSS-6 by under five years. So the probability of reaching EDSS-6 at 10 years uh, for these individuals was 0% in the slow group, 46.4% in the middling group, and 82% in the very rapidly progressive group. It turned out that a shorter time to diagnosis predicted more aggressive progressive disease. They also, interestingly enough, had the highest rate of superimposed relapses. And even one year of EDSS observation had very good probability to identify the prognosis of that group. So we're looking at it here. You don't wanna be the green and the red. Those were the more rapidly progressing cohort. And they kind of kept that throughout their course. It would be particularly important to try to treat those worst groups of primary progressive MS. But remember, there's a cohort that is much more slowly progressing. What are some of the terms that are used in various trials? Confirmed disability progression or CDP, you'll see that. The, the current uh, recommendations are to only use the word progression if you're talking about progressive phenotypes. Don't apply that to relapsing populations. It should be PPMS and SPMS. And it's confirmed typically over 12 weeks, three months, but you'll often see 24 weeks, six months. The longer the confirmation period, the more solid is that progression. Then there's also sustained disability progression, which means they've worsened and 
they remain worse at the end of the study. It is truly sustained. Then there's something called PIRA, Confirmed Disability Progression Independent of Relapse Activity. This has been uh, used in relapsing trials where they try to look at EDSS worsening that's independent of relapses to try to get at this neurodegenerative phase, this hidden neurodegenerative uh, progressive injury. So that's a very interesting marker. Then there's NEP, no evidence of progression. That's typically say there was no confirmed uh, increase on the EDSS or the 25 foot time walk or nine hole peg test to broaden it from just being completely EDSS based. And then there's knee pad, no evidence of progression as we've just defined it or active disease, meaning they also have not had an attack or have not had a new or increasing T2 or contrast MRI lesion over whatever the defined time frame is. And finally, confirmed disability improvement or CDI, the flip side where the EDSS is lowered and that's confirmed over 12 to 24 weeks. That's a very good outcome in CNS repair trials, for example. What are some predictors of how a primary progressive patient is going to do? Well, people are focusing on the spinal cord, cervical cord in particular, and atrophy. That seems to be something that may be very meaningful in progressive MS cohorts. This is another study that looked at really the EDSS and worsening on the EDSS, a clinical marker, but also things like microscopic changes and change in T1 black holes, as well as atrophy. These are measures that get at the neurodegenerative damage process uh, better and are more meaningful as predictors of progressive MS patients that are not going to do well. Um, this was a large study from Magnums that looked at a variety of different MS phenotypes, and they were looking at what predicted uh, disability, late disability, and it was deep gray matter volume loss, in particular, thalamic atrophy. But they found, for example, that secondary progressive MS at baseline showed the lowest cortical and deep gray matter volume. They had the worst atrophy affecting gray matter, both cortex and deep gray matter nuclei. And they also found that uh, the P in the PPMS cohort, they showed the fastest degree of atrophy in the putamen. So the, so the picture was not exactly identical between uh, PPMS and secondary progressive MS and certainly different from relapsing MS in this marker. What are some newer neuroimaging biomarkers of progression? Well, for primary progressive MS, it's bad news to see an increase in chronic white matter T1 black holes develop. For secondary progressive MS, it's bad news to see decrease in T2 lesion volume because of ventricular expansion. Imagine that. Your T2 lesion volume is going down, but it's bad news because it's being gobbled up by the greater atrophy, the ventricles are, are taking out some of the T2 white matter lesions, and so it's falling. That's a bad sign. Another bad sign for SPMS was diffusely abnormal white matter converting to focal lesions. And then a very interesting machine learning technique that can age the brain. It uses neuroimaging features to say how old the brain is. Well, they looked at brain predicted age differences and the MS brain was older than matched brains by about four to six years. This was particularly true in secondary progressive MS. They had the oldest uh, looking brain and disability in MS was predicted by having higher brain predicted age differences, both at baseline and on an annual basis. So you can use machine learning to really do sophisticated analyses to say that MS patients have accelerated brain imaging uh, aging changes. This was again returning to the global MS-based registry, 15,700 MS individuals, and they were following relapsing MS, and over about seven years, 10% converted to secondary progressive MS. Now, the median time to SPMS was 32.4 years. We're seeing fewer relapsing patients transition to secondary progressive disease, but they look for signs. What were warnings that a relapsing patient was going to transition to SPMS? Higher EDSS, 
worsening disability developing at a rapid rate. Higher relapses in the prior year was a bad sign. So that's something to keep in mind if you suddenly have a, a, a midlife relapsing patient having relapses. Longer disease duration and older age were all risk factors for transition to secondary progressive MS. What decreased the risk of transition? Longer time on DMTs and improvement in the degree of disability. And we're now getting multiple studies that indicate the use of DMTs is decreasing the transition to secondary progressive MS. And there was one recent study that looked at high efficacy DMTs, those that were started early within two years of, of MS onset versus those that were used later four to six years into the MS disease process. And there was significantly less disability six to 10 years later when these high efficacy DMTs were used early in the first two years. So the DMTs are at the very least significantly delaying conversion to secondary progressive MS. The question is, are they going to prevent conversion to secondary progressive MS? That is the million dollar question. And this is just a recent study on optical coherence tomography. Uh, and I mention this because it focused on progressive MS and differences in progressive MS. So they looked at relapsing, SPMS, PPMS controls. They did serial CT over a little under four years. Baseline, the secondary progressive MS cohort had thinner peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer and macular ganglia cell interplexiform layer compared to relapsing MS. And at baseline, the PPMS had thinner ganglion cell interplexiform layer compared to relapsing MS. Now, interestingly, the progressive MS cohort showed thinner inner and outer nuclear layers at baseline compared to both relapsing MS and healthy controls. Now, over time, they saw thinning of both the retinal nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell interplexiform layer in the MS cohort, just like you see in healthy controls. But the progressive MS patients showed faster annual loss than relapsing MS in both of these markers and particularly the inner and outer nuclear layer, that was thinning faster with age than relapsing MS and healthy controls. So there was something peculiar to progressive MS. And DMTs didn't impact retinal layer atrophy in progressive MS, whereas they did in relapsing MS, which is interesting. So they concluded that progressive MS was associated with faster retinal atrophy independent of aging, and that in particular, the inner and outer nuclear layers may be something to focus on since something is going on there for progressive MS that seems to be distinct from relapsing MS. So stay tuned, I think we'll see further studies on this. This is just a study done a couple of years ago from Canada that indicated you could see improvement in the EDSS, so-called innate improvement, this is not due to treatment, even in primary progressive MS. They do regular EDSSs annually or biannually. 24% of their PPMS cohort showed an improvement in their EDSS and in 8.4% it was sustained. This has been called innate MS improvement. This is much more common in relapsing than PPMS, but it can happen. So just maybe worthwhile mentioning that to your newly diagnosed patients. This is another interesting um, observation you know about radiologically isolated syndrome or RIS. In the global RIS database, 453 patients, about 34% developed uh, MS in the first five years, a little over 50% in year 10. Well, there were RIS patients who wound up developing PPMS, not CIS relapsing, PPMS. They made up about 12% here. There were 15 in this cohort. They were older, they were more likely to be male, 12 of the 15 had spinal MR, all had lesions. So they said, gosh, if you identify a RIS patient, they're older, they're male, and they have spinal cord lesions, they may be popping up with PPMS in the future. You just need to be aware of that. Very interesting observation. You've also heard about prodromal MS. This is referring to the five to 10 years before the presentation of their initial MS where something's going on medically. Uh, you need huge health administrative databases to be partnered with disease databases. I only mention this because it suggests that the prodrome may be different for those destined to 
uh, show that they have primary progressive MS versus CIS relapsing MS. They actually showed differences uh, both from relapsing MS and, and, and controls. The PPMS showed increase in nervous system encounters, less likely to have pregnancy and childbirth encounters. I think um, this is only one article. We need more documentation of this, but it's extremely interesting to speculate that PPMS may have a different prodrome than relapsing MS that may be important in the future. But what about cognitive impairment in progressive MS? This study looked at primary progressive versus relapsing MS. There was a systematic review and meta-analysis, 47 studies, 37 of them. The PPMS patients had more cognitive impairment than the relapsing patients across all domains, and this was not explained by depression, anxiety, or fatigue. So cognitive loss was common in PPMS. And actually, PPMS may really present with cognitive difficulties in midlife, often associated with psychiatric symptoms. Uh, you may see cortical issues as well. And this shouldn't be surprising. Even though they don't have macroscopic damage to their brain and hemispheres, they have loads of microscopic damage. And so, of course, that might present with cognitive issues. So just be aware of it. It's only about 1% of PPMS, but that can happen. Now, this was an interesting study suggesting relapses could have a bad outcome for progressive MS. This was from the Mayo Clinic. They had a cadre of primary progressive MS patients about onset progressive MS. That refers to an individual that has one attack and then years later goes into a progressive stage. So we'd consider them an unusual SPMS and then a cohort of more conventional SPMS. Look at the ages at which the three groups showed the gradual worsening, 45.7, 45.5, 44.8 years with the EDSS lowest in the primary progressive and highest in the classic secondary progressive. Look at the relapse rate after progression, 3.1% in PPMS, 10.7% in bout onset, 29.5% in the classic SPMS. Most were within five years of onset of progression, 92% and most were age 55 or younger. But only 2% were reaching an EDSS of six, still in a relapsing phase, which indicates that when you get up to an EDSS of six or higher, that likely is a progressive patient. Now they found that time to EDSS six from the progressive onset in half of the patients was 10 years, seven years, and four years respectively in those three cohorts. But a shorter time to EDSS when there were post-progression relapses, older age when progression started in female sex, suggesting seeing relapses is a bad sign. That's quite, that's quite interesting. Um, this is a study on norfilament light protein examined in spinal fluid. Now remember, norfilament light protein is a presumptive biomarker for axon injury, and we're now measuring it in blood using an ultra-sensitive technique, the Samoa technique. Before that, we looked at spinal fluid, which gives you a very clear picture. What this study indicated was that spinal fluid norfilament light protein wasn't very helpful in primary progressive MS. But again, shouldn't be that surprising. What really drives up norfilament light protein? Acute attacks, relapses, focal inflammation. What this really reminds us is that it may not be a super great marker in a more smoldering neurodegenerative component like primary progressive MS. Let's turn now to our final piece of long-term management. You, you know, patients are very clever. They know if they have prime, they, they know if they have progressive MS, primary or secondary progressive. That's not really good news. But we can explain that the course is not inexorable. We need to really emphasize health maintenance, wellness, and controlling comorbid conditions, particular vascular comorbid conditions. We want to optimize symptomatic therapy, and uh, we now have an approved DMT for primary progressive MS, and we have DMTs for active secondary progressive MS, and there are a number of trials where they're looking at getting new therapies for progressive MS and CNS repair strategies, which would be wonderful. So these are good things to talk about when you're diagnosing somebody as having a progressive phenotype. This wellness list, 
this should be a major emphasis. This should be spoken about as an independent disease modifying therapy. Increasing data, how valuable this is to promote brain health, to promote brain reserve, to promote CNS reserve, to help an MS individual age better. This is incredibly important. This should be a major, major counseling issue that we do, particularly with our progressive MS patients, but do it with any newly diagnosed MS individual. When we look at our AAN practice guidelines from 2018, they said we should be offering DMTs to active secondary progressive MS. We should be offering ocrelizumab to primary progressive MS patients who are likely to benefit, but that we need to evaluate the readiness or reluctance to initiate a DMT. We should counsel on realistic expectations. We should counsel about comorbidities and adverse health behaviors and potential drug interactions. Counsel on PML that is particularly uh, pertinent to some of our disease modifying therapies. And then they also raise the possibility that if you have a secondary progressive MS patient and their EDSS is seven or higher, meaning they're wheelchair bound, and that's for two or more years, perhaps you discuss, is there really a benefit of a DMT that they're on and should you consider a discontinuing it if this is somebody that's been on long-term treatment? So there are some official um, guidelines to help us from uh, the AAN. Now, there's only one DMT that's approved for primary progressive MS, and that is the humanized anti-CD20 ocrelizumab. In the United States, it was approved for adults with primary progressive MS. In Europe, they approved it for adults with early PPMS and neuroimaging features characteristic of inflammatory activities such as new or enlarging T2 lesions or contrast lesions, early active PPMS, so a little bit different. This was Oratorio, the phase three trial, where PPMS patients were randomized to ocrelizumab, 600 milligrams IV every six months, or a placebo infusion IV every six months. This was the primary outcome, confirmed disability progression over 12 weeks. What I wanna point out is the lines are separating by six months, by 24 weeks. That is an anti-inflammatory separation. It was statistically significant. Um, this is what got uh, this anti-CD20 approved for primary progressive MS, but that can't be a neurodegenerative effect. That has to be an anti-inflammatory effect. Now, they found that the PPMS patients that had contrast lesions at entry uh, had a better progression benefit than those that did not as a focal inflammatory marker. You did see benefits on suppressing increase in T2 lesion volume and actually went down in the treated cohort, you saw significantly less development of brain volume loss atrophy in the treated uh, PPMS cohort. And this is um, just a six and a half year data uh, where you now have um, extension data where those that were on placebo initially have now been um, switched over to active agent. They don't catch up. The group that started treatment initially still has less 24-week confirmed disability progression. They have less nine-hole peg test worsening as a hand measure. And treatment uh, meant a 42% relative reduction in reaching a wheelchair. So there was clear benefit in starting that treatment as soon as possible. Now, Ocrelizumab doesn't really penetrate the CNS. It's less than 0.1%. It's really acting, I think, outside the CNS on the systemic inflammatory immune system. And it's amazing that it has such benefit so quickly in showing an effect on progression in PPMS and indicating that the systemic immune system is a player in that worsening. Oratorio was uh, informed by a failed phase two primary progressive trial, Olympus, that looked at rituximab, another chimeric similar anti-CD20 versus placebo. So what they did in oratorio was they capped the age. They didn't enter PPMS patients who were above age 55. They required everybody be ambulatory. They capped the MS disease duration at 15 years, 
they required abnormal spinal fluid as an inflammatory marker, and thus they enriched. 26% of the oratorio PPMS uh, cohort had contrast-enhancing lesions on baseline, and they seem to have an even more uh, profound uh, impact on progression. Now, the FDA asked them to do a post hoc analysis based on sex. Lo and behold, a zinger, a surprise. Women with PPMS did not see a progression benefit. It was identical in the placebo versus the treated cohort. This doesn't seem valid. It's weird, but it has to be addressed. I do discuss it with my patients, and there are ongoing studies that are going to look to make sure that there's no sex based difference. Anti CD20, of course eliminates circulating B cells. It doesn't get all the B cells in the tissue. It also eliminates a very small minority of T cells that express CD20. It's about three to 5%. And they appear to be highly activated in pro-inflammatory T cells. So they are driven down by anti-CD20 as well. Now, saponamide. Saponamide is a second generation S1P receptor, fingolimod. That had a, a phase three trial. Uh, that was positive in secondary progressive MS. Saponamide in the US did not get approved simply for SPMS. It got approved for adults with relapsing forms of MS to include CIS, never had a CIS trial, relapsing remitting disease, and active SPMS. In Europe, it got approved for adults with SPMS with active disease, meaning relapses or imaging features of inflammatory activity. Now, Saponamide is in the S1P receptor modulator class. Uh, the first uh, agent was fingolimod, but unlike fingolimod, it, it's not a prodrug. It doesn't need to be phosphorylated. It has a much shorter half-life. You can wash it out within a week, and it's much more selective. Instead of S1P receptors 1 and 3, 4, and 5, like fingolimod, it hits S1P receptors 1 and 5, missing 3, which is particularly enriched in the cardiac tissue. So again, as I say, it's approved for relapsing forms of MS to include active SPMS. What do you need to screen for? You need to do some genotyping. We would typically do a CBC with diff. We check for VZV, IgG. We do a liver panel. We get an eye exam. We do an EKG. We, we would review what drugs they're taking to make sure there aren't any that would slow the heart rate or might uh, affect AV conduction. Uh, less than 0.4% of Caucasians will have a genotype where they can't take symponamide. Another 10 to 15% may have a genotype where they can't go on the maximum dose of two milligrams. They can't go over one milligram. For the majority of individuals, they don't need first dose monitoring unless they have sinus bradycardia, first or second degree AV block, or history of a myocardial infarct or congestive heart failure. You can get away with dose titrating it over the first week, the first six days. This was their phase three trial expand and entered 1,651 progressing SPMS patients. It was event driven. They were randomized two to one to oral saponamide, two milligrams versus a, a, a placebo. This was a pretty severe SPMS cohort. They were able to show a 21% relative decrease in confirmed 12 week progression 26% versus 32%, it was significant, although it was critiqued as not being dramatic. Uh, relapses were rare, but the annualized relapse rate was decreased by 55% with saponamide, and there were positive MRI changes, less T2 lesion volume development, less contrast lesions, less newer enlarging lesions, less brain atrophy compared to the placebo cohort. It did work best, in SP patients who were younger with shorter disease duration, with lower EDSS, with prior attacks, and baseline contrast lesions, and those that were DMT naive. And five-year data was due to be presented in Toronto at the AAN. This is open label extension. The initial saponamide group remained less likely to meet three and six month confirmed disability progression compared to the group that had a delay in starting saponamide. They were still showing decreased relapses, more so than that delayed treatment <clears throat> cohort by 52%, and also decreased confirmed worsening on a um, simple digit modality test cognitive measure. Mesitinib. This is an oral selective tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It acts on innate immune cells, mast cells, and others. 
there has been a phase 2B3 trial now published yet that has been reported, prospective, randomized, two to one, double blind, placebo controlled in progressive MS, PPMS, and non-active SPMS. So they looked at two different doses of mesitinib, 4.5 milligram per kilogram per day. And then they had a second group where they went up to six milligram per kilogram per day. And they had placebo groups for both of the different doses. So there were actually four groups. It turned out the 4.5 milligram per kilogram per day progressive group, 200 patients versus place their placebo, 101, showed less deterioration on the EDSS. It was statistically significant. They saw benefits in both PPMS and non-active SPMS. They saw a delayed time to EDSS 7. They didn't see a benefit in the six milligram per kilogram group surprisingly. So we'll see what happens with this. And we wait to see the publication. The ASCEND trial was a phase three secondary progressive trial uh, looking at natalizumab versus placebo. It failed on the primary outcome, although there was some benefit on nine hole peg test upper extremity. But I think this was basically a failed study. The butylast, this is an oral small molecule phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Uh, it's available in Japan and Korea, where it's used post-stroke to treat dizziness and used to treat asthma. This was studied in a phase 2B trial, sprint trial, that entered both primary progressive and secondary progressive, 255 patients. They were randomized to take up to 50 milligrams twice a day of abutilas versus placebo over 96 weeks. They could be on interferon beta or glutaramer acetate. The primary outcome was whole brain atrophy, that was significantly lessened by abutilast over placebo. Uh, other um, findings were a little bit mixed, looking at microscopic damage. It looked like there was an impact on mag transfer imaging, but not diffusion tensor imaging. There wasn't an impact on the OCT. It was well tolerated. And in a post hoc analysis, it seems like the atrophy benefits was driven by PPMS rather than SPMS, which is really weird. Uh, there's no phase three trial yet for ibutilast, and we'll see what happens with this agent. Symphostatin had a positive phase two trial in secondary progressive MS compared to placebo, where it slowed brain atrophy, brain volume loss. It's now in a much larger phase three SPMS trial, MS STAT2, entering 1,180 SPMS patients, where they're being randomized to 80 milligrams of symphostatin versus placebo and we'll see what happens with that. Some other novel therapies for progressive MS, EBV sensitized T lymphocytes, two different approaches, bile acid supplementation, BTK oral inhibitors are not just for relapsing MS, they are being evaluated or the plans are to evaluate them in progressive forms of MS, lipoic acid, exasomib, Depo GA, 40 milligrams IM monthly, is being um, tested in primary progressive MS. The Actimus trial is looking at IV infusions of autologous filtered bone marrow versus autologous blood infusion as a control. And then um, BEAT MS is, is looking at hematopoietic stem cell transplant versus active SPMS and relapsing MS. We are, we, that's not being done in primary progressive MS. Well, what about CNS repair strategies? These might enhance recovery from a relapse, improve fixed deficit, or might really be general strategies to improve CNS reserve. In a certain sense, you can consider wellness and managing comorbidities as general CNS repair promoting strategies. Well, some of the things that we're looking at, high dose biotin, we're gonna see in a minute, unfortunately that failed. That was due to be presented in Toronto at the AAN. Uh, blocking inhibitory factors for um, repair, that's opacinumab and elizanumab. Oral clomastine as a remyelinating agent, lyothyronine, stem cell therapies, and even nanotechnology. This is the high-dose pure biotin. Such hope, even if, even if it was just a minority. Unfortunately, the larger, longer 15-month uh, progressive phase three trial was negative primary and secondary outcomes were not met. And unfortunately, biotin is not going to be a CNS repair strategy. Opacinumab has been studied in a couple of trials currently in the affinity trial where it's being added 
versus a placebo added to uh, pre-existing DMT, and you're looking at uh, better functioning. Elizanumab is, is another monoclonal antibody that blocks an inhibitory factor. That's actually being studied in relapsing forms, but the proof of principle would be if it results in CNS repair, that would be a good thing for progressive MS as well. And the interesting nanotechnology techniques, um, clean facetted gold nanocrystals, the CNM L8, they should improve the energy supply to neurons and axons and can induce axon remyelinization. They've been successful in animal models. Their studies are not just limited to MS, they're also being pursued in ALS and Parkinson's. There's a current phase two MS trial, visionary MS, in individuals with chronic optic neuropathy. They're being randomized two to one to oral gold nanocrystals versus a placebo. Um, at the most recent Actrams meeting in Florida, they gave preliminary blinded data on the first 34 individuals uh, who entered the trial, and they were showing improvements in certain outcomes. Their plan is to go up to 150 patients. This is a very intriguing thing. We'll see if it is a successful CNS repair strategy. We don't have any yet. So to sum up, this has been a discussion of progressive MS, primary progressive, and secondary progressive. Progressive MS is truly distinct from relapsing MS. Relapsing MS is the focal inflammatory phase. You're largely missing that, I think, not completely, but largely missing it in primary progressive MS. Um, progressive, M uh, um, progressive MS is the neurodegenerative damage phase. It's representing what's happening at the level of synapses, axons, and neurons. We need a holistic therapeutic approach. It's great to get DMTs, but you must follow the wellness. You must control the comorbid factors that are damaging the brain, allow the brain to age better and repair better. And we are seeing therapies become available. So I think that's the message of hope, hope that we need to convey to our MS patients. And there's more and more focus on progressive MS and CNS repair, because these are gap areas. We need better treatments for neurodegeneration um, progressive MS may be started very early since neurodegeneration is present from the earliest time point, and we need CNS repair strategies. Thank you so much.